teach the ones that already know about that. And everyone is watching us know exactly what I'm saying. And all the importance that we have had for the research in terms of innovation for the products that I use in healthcare and the diagnosis and the prevention and even in treatment and the rehab of infirmity. On the following slide, I would like to comment upon the following topic. I'm waiting for the next slide, please. Would you please share the second slide? Tiago, would you please uh, move on to the next slide? No, it's not. On the next slide, I'll be covering some things uh, from the World Health Assembly. That's going to discuss some topics. World Health Assembly. That's going to discuss some topics that are very important. If you can share, it will be very important. Otherwise, I have to access mine on my computer to see uh, if I can read that precisely. I believe we had a problem on Zoom. I can continue commenting. But what we can see here essentially in the World Health Assembly that has to do with us is the preparation and answers before the emergencies of public health, including this response to the pandemic. It was a central Discussion, discussion of ministries of health worldwide. And the international community of research has been involved to it. The international community of science technology is very important because it is the topic that is informed by this research both the measures for public health, epidemiologies, the best resources to fight this pandemic in terms of diagnosis, treatment, prevention of this vaccine, they go through the capability that we might have so that we can produce and deliver products that are used, properly used in this pandemic. The second topic that is strongly related to us is the agenda of immunization. I'm sorry, would you go back to the previous slide? This one, yes. Which is the agenda of immunization to 2030. There is something which is very important, which is prevention to all um, uh, infirmities. But it is very expensive for all of us, this situation related to immunization. And the third point is the application of the international sanitary regulation. And the fourth point is the global strategy and the public, the global public health plan of action, which is a document, a resolution that has been discussed for so long and developed for so long by the WHO. And it has to do with us because the topic has to do with the products and results of our research. And it has been a very important obstacle so that we can increase the production of our vaccine. On the next slide, I'd like to make some comments. And this slide shows exactly what is the positioning of that um, is an independent panel, which is COVID-19, let's make it last the last pandemic. That's a desire, that's a, a, a dream that we have got for our, for our future. And in fact, we would mitigate any possibility of a new pandemic. 
That's a, an independent committee that was presided by Helen Clark, a former president, and uh, Alan Johnson Sirleaf from Liberia, um, followed by 11 members, um, high quality political and technical members. And there was a reinforcement of the WHO. And they also created a Council of Global Health to reform international sanitary regulation and simulate R&D to generate knowledges and resources to face the current and new pandemics. And everything is put in this plan, including this plan, and to have this international treaty for the next six months, that there should be this treaty up and running. And I remember about the treaty, for example, of tobacco control that lasted 10 years for negotiating that. Of course, because the industry is going to influence that. The industry didn't want to have the tobacco control treaty because of commercial and trade issues, of course, and interest. And for the pandemic, it's the same. And finally, they stimulate R&D in order to generate resources, in order to generate uh, knowledge to face a new pandemics. And on the following slide, it shows uh, a scheme that uh, uh, trying to make us um, understand things better. I would like to add that where we have science, technology, research, development and innovation could contribute not only to fight this pandemic, but also the future pandemics that threaten our planet. A major research group is included into what we would call, uh, we can call um, research in systems, understanding the organization, the structure of services and better schemes that can connect primary care with intensive care. Lessons learned, what should be changed in intensive care? The whole investigation, which comes afterwards clinical, investigation and trials investigation, development and assessment of the proper therapeutics, morbidity, mortality, how they are distributed and which were the major causes that led uh, the ill to die. Trials of diagnostics, therapeutic trials and vaccine trials. And these results should also be transported into practice. On the other hand, we have a whole field of the basic research of biomedical and biological research with a huge contribution which they may provide if we all use, in this case, what we usually call the concept of One Health. We cannot, and our Dean mentioned this morning, the importance of interdisciplinarity. Just to give you an example, the University of Aveiro does that, and Jose Paulo from Fiocruz also mentioned the experience of connection between uh, your speech for the development of proper knowledge related, for example, to the sanitation or to the environment in my opinion, something very important for the research of infectious diseases and to face and fight this pandemic and future pandemics which may come, the important framework is the One Health. And this concept of One Health implies having a knowledge of all the complex processes that are present in the relations between human and animal health in a complex ecosystem. I do not wish here to restrict to the ecosystem issues that are only environmental 
related physical environment like forests, biodiversity, desertification, air pollution, water pollution, sanitation. But I also would like to mention the importance that in this transsectorial view, within the concept of one health may lead us to focus on structural issues. We cannot ignore that the way of producing and consuming of the human society, which became more complex and grew extremely. Our population has grown a lot. This establishes processes of production and consumption that involve huge economic interests in agribusiness also. The way how the forest is explored, let us say, the destruction of forests, our invasion of forest spaces, which reduce these spaces and change biodiversity due to our economic presence, not only of individuals, human beings, but mainly by the agribusiness. And that is where I say that when health is not only the concept of human, animal health and ecosystem, this concept should become broader. It should become the structural one health, which are the economic and political rules that established as they are, have a very strong influence on the way how human beings, but mainly companies, relate to the environment. This is a major concern, not only for researchers, but it is a deep concern to economic leaderships, social leadership, social movements, but also business leaders. There is now a huge concern and we are researchers and we want to work in an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary manner. We should organize our research in my opinion, looking at this type of proposal, like the one of Glopid. As you know, Glopid has written this paper. It has been published on The Lancet two weeks ago. It's a very important scheme because it contains a prediction of pandemics. It discusses the problems of the private sector and also cross-cutting, such as biobank sequencing, big data, etc. cohort studies, longitudinal trials. It is very important to look at this scheme very carefully so we can really understand what we should do, not only with regard to the pandemic, but to healthcare issues in general. We should have a multidisciplinary approach. This scheme prepared by Glopid is very important. Please take a careful look at it. And I don't want to go beyond the time I have. I have 23 minutes. I don't want to make anybody late. So I should be careful with my time. I will now talk about the international cooperation of Fiocruz. We have an idea of structural cooperation in healthcare, which is a south-south cooperation, but also north-south, which is not only the idea of donor and receiver, uh, but it is an idea of partnership and it is structuring. Why? Because when we make a careful assessment of an international cooperation project, we can see that we have grown and we helped the partners who uh, belong to this cooperation to grow. This is what we call a structuring cooperation. It should not focus on one aspect only. And if it is, this small aspect should be seen and understood, and it should dialogue with the whole that explains all the issues related to healthcare and society, the contribution of biological sciences, clinical sciences, and public health science, and also social sciences applied to health and the structural one health may be a good scheme to understand. Phil Cruz, well, I saw the presentation of our team. It was 
amazing. It describes very carefully how broad our cooperation is with the University of Aveiro. We have solid cooperation with uh, developed and developing countries. Our story begins with Osvaldo Cruz coming back from Paris and already establishing with Pasteur Institute a strong scheme to exchange knowledge and information. Osvaldo Cruz has beautiful uh, bronze plates close to Zé Paulo's door with lots of thanks to the global community, special, especially the Latin American one, because of the cooperation between Osvaldo Cruz and partners from Argentina, Uruguay, and many other countries back then. Our history with um, Pasteur is a paradigm, and now our cooperation with the European Union, many developed countries of Europe, and the National Institute of Health in the United States is very solid. We are now talking to the NAIG. Antonio Fauci is the leader of a joint project on COVID-19. But prevention of COVID-20, 21, 23, other COVIDs that might come in the future, not only COVIDs, but eventually also other infectious diseases, which is our main focus here at the Foundation Osvaldo Cruz, not only related to biomedical sciences, but also with the other focuses I mentioned before, this is all important for biological, biomedical, and clinic sciences contributing to public health and sci social sciences in all their dimensions and social and economic policies. This is what should uh, guide research at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, as the dean mentioned about the University of Aveiro. And to finish, I would like to mention the importance of the international cooperation at Fiocruz, it becomes stronger year after year. And for this year, we have a very important scenario because the pandemic, unfortunately, is forcing us to work monothematically, let's say. But we should seize the, this opportunity and we should increase our international cooperation, even though we will eventually begin working, focusing on the COVID the pandemic. The world needs research in healthcare, not only to prevent other pandemics, but also to solve many other health problems that are a real threat to our world in several dimensions, either by diseases or uh, environmental, social, and economic issues, or because of the response which can be given by the healthcare system. And this is very important. So. Uh, public health researchers are extremely important. I do hope I contributed, and I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk with this amazing community of the IOC that has been giving us such solid, important examples of commitment with the international cooperation of Fiocruz with Brazil and the global community. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Paulo. Nós te agradecemos. Thank you very much, Paulo. We are really thankful because you shared us their broad view on international cooperation. You are positioning our team and all the participants of this event on the importance of these high level panels focused right now on fighting COVID-19. Thank you very much. I understand uh, clearly that you focused on your time. Thank you very much, Paulo questions will be asked at the end of our panel. We have two other presentations right now. The next presentation deals uh, with cooperation opportunities and potential between Brazil and Nova New Zealand. We have 15 hours difference because of time differences. We cannot count on a live presentation of the supporters of this initiative. But we have a video which has been recorded by the ambassador of New Zealand to Brazil, by the director of the Asian Pacific Center of Excellence, Dr. Paulo Camargo, the ambassador, Browning Kelly, uh, I'm executive yeah. vice president and manager of the portfolio of research and innovation, and Amy Rutherford, regional director for the Americas, the Middle East and Europe, and New Zealand regional director. Uh, I'm Claudia Camel, so, uh, advisor. Can you please 
begin the video from New Zealand. who had the opportunity to visit some research. Uh, I'm Claudia Camel, uh, advisor. Uh, Eu sou Claudia Camel, assessora para, do vice-diretor de pesquisa, desenvolvimento tecnológico e inovação no Instituto Oswaldo Cruz, Fiocruz Brasil. É com grande alegria que eu abro esse painel, dando as boas-vindas a todos e agradecendo pela oportunidade de apresentar uma visão pragmática sobre como a ciência é conduzida na Nova Zelândia com a doutora Marise Mia, do Laboratório de Virologia Comparada e Ambiental do Instituto. E a partir de um convite do Education New Zealand, nós tivemos a oportunidade de visitar alguns centros de pesquisa dedicados a temas ligados aos ecossistemas aquáticos e tivemos o privilégio de ver como a ciência é estruturada em torno dos 11 desafios mundiais um programa do governo que promove uma colaboração intensa entre múltiplas organizações. Eu gostaria de apresentar quatro convidados que irão falar um pouco sobre a perspectiva para o Brasil. São o embaixador Miguel, que assumiu o cargo e já tinha desenvolvido carreiras diplomáticas, Dr. Brown Wayne Kelly, vice-chefe e gerente de sistemas de planejamento da University of New Zealand, Dr. Matthew Omiger, diretor do Latin American Center, e Amy Rutherford, diretora regional para as Américas, Oriente Médio e Europa. Muito obrigada a todos por terem aceito o convite para participar do primeiro simpósio internacional de pesquisa e inovação do Instituto Oswaldo Cruz. Também celebramos o aniversário do Instituto Oswaldo Cruz, 121 anos. Esse painel vai discutir a estratégias de cooperação entre Brasil e Nova Zelândia. Antes de começar, eu gostaria de dizer que eu fiquei muito impressionada com o país de vocês, a beleza natural e o povo extremamente amigável. Agora, vou passar a palavra para o embaixador. Chris, você poderia falar sobre a sua visão de como a cooperação nos setores da ciência pode contribuir para o desenvolvimento e a colaboração entre países, principalmente Brasil e Nova Zelândia? Esse tipo de relacionamento é uma prioridade para o governo da Nova Zelândia? Sim, muito obrigado. Antes de mais nada, eu gostaria de agradecer em nome de todos por nos deixar participar desse simpósio. É fantástico estar envolvido e falar um pouco sobre a Nova Zelândia. Quero parabenizar também o Instituto pelo seu aniversário de 121 anos de existência. Todos nós devemos aspirar a chegar lá. Parabéns. Para o governo da Nova Zelândia, é uma prioridade desenvolver conexões com outros países. Na nossa opinião, isso faz parte da diplomacia. Nova Zelândia, como vocês sabem, é um país pequeno, nós estamos no Pacífico Sul, não somos extremamente importantes nessa área, então, para nós é extremamente importante formar parcerias com outros. Ganhamos relevância, aumentamos o nosso impacto no mundo como resultado dessas colaborações. 
a good example of that, I think, is one of the issues we face here in New Zealand is meeting our climate change. A lot of methane gas in our agriculture. Um, so New Zealand has global research alliance um, on agriculture. We will work with many countries around the world, including Brazil. Um, um, so collaboration um, part of our international work. Typically on Brazil, um, uh, 2018, um, education and science collaboration is already a really strong relationship, but there's real potential for it to, to develop further. Um, in my time in Brazil, prior to the pandemic, we had a really strong exchange of delegations in both directions. New Zealand going to Brazil and Brazil down to New Zealand. Um, um, really strong interest on the part of New Zealand institutions, um, the universities and the research institutions and finding... Então, temos muitas universidades, instituição de pesquisa e buscamos áreas de colaboração. Obviamente, com a pandemia, se tornou muito mais difícil viajar pelo mundo. I hope we can continue to offer opportunities for collaboration um, between our two countries. But, but I think it's most interesting. Ron will talk a little bit about that. Um, but I, I personally am very area of strength between New Zealand and Brazil. Um, okay, so could you talk a little about how connectivity and interaction between universities and what works well? Thank you. And on behalf of the opportunity to talk to you all today, um, I'd like to just build on um, what um, the ambassador has um, said about New Zealand being a small country. Um, being small does have its advantages. So connectivity. Um, you know, we, we are a very small country, five million people, eight universities, a handful of crown research institutes, a handful of independent research institutes and regional research institutes. Um, but not a very big um, uh, country in, in terms of our research capacity. However, what that does mean is that we are very well connected to one another. Everybody knows everybody in New Zealand. Um, so that's, uh, you know, one thing that certainly I'm um, very proud of um, in New Zealand. And there are several formal ways um, in which the research organisations, including universities, um, collaborate with one another and with businesses and businesses. And those include um, things like every university has um, a research office and a commercial commission office. And these offices are really the um, researchers and industry. So it's a two-way flow of exchange through the research and commercialization offices. Um, we also have a, an amazing organization called KiwiNet. And this okay. is um, an organization that was formed by 18 of the research organizations in New Zealand who have voluntarily come together to share resources, to pool funding, um, and to really work collaboratively to uh, maximize the economic benefit of innovation in New Zealand. Um, That's there wonderful. Are, <laughs> and um, there are also government incentives to collaborate, which I'd like to, to talk about, because as we know, um, incentives and government policies drive behavior. And we're very fortunate in New Zealand that our government is very supportive of uh, research collaborations. So um, for instance, we have the New Zealand Research um, and Development Tax Credit. So New Zealand um, businesses can get a 15% tax credit on any research and development uh, work that are, um, that's undertaken by research providers in New Zealand. So that's a real incentive to um, drive businesses and industry to engage uh, with our research providers and in R&D. 
Um, we also have, as you mentioned before, um, the National Science Challenges. You, you wanted me to talk to, to those. Um, and so we have 11 of those in New Zealand. Now, what they are, they are large um, uh, programs, collaborative programs between businesses, non-government organisations, universities, and Crown Research Institutes um, that are designed to address New Zealand's greatest science-based problems. Uh, like for instance, the Deep South, Deep South National um, Science Challenge um, looks at um, how the oceans and, and changes near the Antarctic in terms of ocean research is going to impact on New Zealand um, and New Zealand's climate and its economy. Um, so those national science challenges are, are held in very high regard in New Zealand and they're long-term programs. So we are looking, you know, 10, eight to 10 year investments um, by government in those long-term issues. Um, the other um, key area of collaboration um, in New Zealand is around um, the Centres of Research Excellence, um, which is also a government funded um, program. And we've got 10 of those starting um, in July of this year. And the majority of them are around environmental, but there's also several um, looking at um, health and well-being um, of New Zealanders. And these are also inter-institutional programs um, that um, are, are long-term funded, so seven years of, of funding, which really gives us as researchers the opportunity to uh, get momentum in terms of our um, research and to aim towards outcomes, not just outputs, but outcomes uh, for New Zealand. Okay. Um, I can talk a little bit about um, what works well, um, your second yes, uh, session please. In, in New Zealand. Um, well, obviously, um, uh, being small, as, as we mentioned, means that our collaborations work um, really, really well. Um, and the fact that we do have government policies and incentives to collaborate. So I think that's an area we can be very proud of. Um, we also have a very, very high performing university sector uh, in New Zealand. We perform really well on the international um, stage and most of our universities have a very, very broad um, spectrum of research expertise. So we can do research in any number of, of areas, which is a huge strength um, for New Zealand. Uh, the other thing that I think um, makes New Zealand really attractive to researchers overseas, to businesses overseas wanting to work with um, New Zealand, is the fact um, that we are rated um, constantly uh, over the last 10 years, one of the least corrupt countries um, in the world on the uh, Corruption Perception Index, which I think makes us really attractive um, to our international partners uh, wanting to engage with us. Um, and then lastly, your, your third um, question about what areas, I guess, are uh, potential um, areas of collaboration between Brazil and New Zealand. I think um, in that regard, we need to look at our common areas of, of interest. Um, and obviously, both countries being um, largely agricultural economies, um, I think there's, there's potential there to look at um, agricultural productivity, uh, land-based um, research, as well as research in our oceans and um, fisheries, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so being an agricultural economy, both, both countries, I think, is a, an area we can um, uh, uh, take advantage of um, in terms of research. Um, there's also, you know, before COVID-19, the world, including New Zealand, including Brazil, um, were worried um, about a number of things um, uh, and, and those things have not gone away. So as, as we mentioned um, earlier, climate change is a, a big area of research interest um, in New Zealand. We've also got, you know, major health concerns um, we've got an ageing population. Um, I understand it's similar in, in Brazil and certainly in the, the rest of South America. So uh, a lot of research is being directed um, uh, in terms of, you know, health care for um, our ageing population. Um, and of course, sustainability is a big thing. Uh, we've got the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which we're all working towards, and sustainability is, is a key focus of a lot of research um, programs um, in New Zealand. So I hope that answers uh, all three questions. Yes, uh, what, what really impresses me, me when I was there, like talking,
from uh, researchers in, in the research centers and things that will carried out in the uh, consulate in, in Sao Paulo is, is the spirit of collaboration uh, everywhere in New Zealand. It's, it's like when you said the, the companies sort of voluntarily came together to, to sponsor, to support research, that is, is such good news. How does this thing happen? You know, can you talk a little bit of, 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 about this? Uh, I think, uh, again, it uh, relates back to the fact that we are a small country and, um, you know, we realise that there's only five million of us and we need to look after one another. Um, we've got um, a government at the moment that's very focused on, on well-being of New Zealanders, so we're all looking out for one another and I think that stimulates natural um, uh, collaboration. Uh, I think the, the other thing really that I've noticed, for instance, during COVID-19 is that um, it's actually brought us even closer together uh, because, you know, instead of having infrequent, large, in-person uh, meetings, we've ended up having lots of short, frequent um, Zoom meetings. And so that's actually brought us closer together because we all realise we're in the same boat. Um, and equally with our international collaborators, we recognise the impact of COVID-19 on them too. And so I think um, in some in some strange way, it's actually brought us all together. So there's that dynamic as well that's, that's constantly in play at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, I would like to address my next question to Matthew. Uh, so it goes, uh, you work to enhance New Zealand's economic, trade, political and cultural relationships across Latin America, although not around science. So however, could you talk a little about how you engage New Zealand students, all sorts of students, across the cultural, social, economic, economic spectrum, including indigenous students, of course, around opportunities in Brazil and across South America, please. Thank you, Claudia. Lo <clears throat> lovely to see you again, and thank you for coming to New Zealand last year. Thank week. you. Um, we start from the position that many New Zealanders aren't aware of the potential to engage with Latin America. So we, off we primarily focus on projects that capture attention and then build relationships. And that applies to our science projects as well as our non-science projects. Uh, we were given a specific mandate by the New Zealand government and the primary focus is business and language, but science is not neglected. We've sent students to Brazil and other parts of Latin America for science policy advice. We've sent a student from uh, Canterbury University to an Antarctic program. Uh, possibly our most interesting um, bilateral collaboration is with Chile. It's a winds of change, climate change program. The idea is that New Zealand and Chile have such similar geographies in part that we're trying to think, well, they must have common climate change challenges. So how do we get students talking to each other to address common issues? Um, with Brazil, we look at it from an entrepreneurship and innovation angle. Uh, we're always keen to support any projects which have both a scientific outcome and a commercial outcome, because ultimately we were given the task of preparing New Zealanders to do business and engage with our region. Um, perhaps though the most exciting project of all is focused on students and science, but at the moment, it's focused on secondary students. It's an Amazon project where uh, we work with um, colleagues from the Universidad de São Paulo, um, the uh, Universidade Federal do Amazonas, Instituto Nacional de Pesquisa de Amazonas, to um, capture with virtual reality technology the Amazonian rainforest, talk to indigenous leaders in Brazil, and produced 3D uh, presentations, which we took around New Zealand cities last year. And this year, we're transitioning that project into a classroom project for schools. The idea is that students will leave secondary school love, loving the science, far more aware of Brazil, and able to sort of, if you like, convert their teachers when they get to university. It's all designed to grow the interest, the numbers, the knowledge, the capacity of New Zealanders to understand Latin America. And we hope that will in turn aid 
uh, academic relationships as well. One of the earliest things we did was to, to um, do a video on a New Zealand marine ecologist um, at USP and talking about how science is done in Brazil. So yes, we'd love the scientific collaborations. We start with the students. And what about the indigenous uh, community, the students? Uh, are, do they get uh, full engaged in this project too? Uh, the, every project we do is available to every New Zealand university student, whether they're in the consortium of universities in the Cape or not. We do have an indigenous uh, program specifically, and its focus is Brazil. At the moment, its focus is on tourism, um, but the project is always evolving. And were there to be an interest in bringing up the science connection, we could absolutely talk to the leads on that. The CAPE is a bit of a collective effort. It's four universities working together, um, but Indigenous links are fundamental um, to our broader CAPE program, and they can be part of this as well. Yes, that's lovely. I'm sure we collaborate in this in this area so very much. Uh, I mean, Fio Cruz and, and, and the Latin Cafe uh, program. Thank you very much, Matthew. So my next question will, will, will be Amy, please. Um, education New Zealand works to advance the New Zealand government's international education aims around the world. And in light of the effects of COVID-19 on students and academic mobility and engagement, of course, how has the work that you are doing across your region changed? In the last couple of years, um, Prior to the pandemic, Education New Zealand had taken a focus on developing and strengthening our relationships across the education sector, both in Brazil, but more broadly across Latin America as well. So we had delegations coming from Brazil to New Zealand, like you were on, um, Claudia, and then we also had delegations of um, New Zealanders going into uh, Brazil as well, academic cooperation seminars as well um, on both sides. So when the pandemic um, reached the world last year um, and it, it's interesting to think that the delegation that you were on Claudia was the last one that came into New Zealand before yes. the borders closed which seems mm -hmm. a long time ago but we were um, we already had this sort of small but solid network to build from in terms of academics on both sides who were already engaging um, with one another and in terms of how things have changed I think what we do hasn't really changed in terms of the way that we focus on um, developing, uh, helping to develop engagement between the New Zealand and say Brazilian side, but how we do it has entirely changed. So like everyone else, we have uh, moved on online into, into the digital space to continue that yes. collaboration and cooperation. But I also recognize that it must be strange for um, people who are um, watching this in Brazil to see us sitting in a room together so close to one another. <laughs> So not, but so we're straddling this interesting um, kind of time in New Zealand. Where in New Zealand, we are working in pre-pandemic ways. Collaboration is happening just as we work in a lab. lab is still happening. But we're also um, straddling that digital um, divide um, through, with our. Um, collaborators um, outside of New Zealand as well. So we, it's a very interesting time for us and uh, moving into that digital space. And in terms of um, ways that we've changed what we're doing, uh, last year we um, created a program called Kōrero Conversations That Matter, okay. to, um, to have uh, groups of New Zealand academics having these conversations around issues that matter, sustainability, education, international education, agriculture, agricultural technology, those kinds of uh, uh, topics. And we use that as a way to stay connected while borders are closed. And we started that in Latin America and we had um, strong participation from people from uh, Brazil as well, but we've expanded that out across my region. So we started with this idea um, in Latin America and it's become a really successful way to stay engaged during this time when we can't physically meet. And I will say one other thing. Normally, I'm based in Washington, D.C. I'm, I'm back in New Zealand at, at the moment. Um, and it, it really has struck me, having had my experience for almost a year in D.C., working from home in this digital um, environment, coming back into New Zealand and having in-person collaboration, how important that is too. 
So I am looking forward to when the borders start to reopen and people start to travel more around the world because that in-person engagement, even though the digital side of things has really um, kept everything going, that in-person engagement and that collaboration in person is also very important as well. Well, yes, yeah, it's priceless. But uh, I'm very really impressed the way the way you sort of uh, came forward and bringing all these new strategies to to uh, uh, to not let the the collaboration stop. Um, recently, I have received a uh, mail to um, enroll in a master in, in a in a set of master classes and 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 the diversity of themes and and like short uh, classes and uh, very, very interesting things. Uh, I thought it was so um, innovative and, and so upfront. Um, so congratulations on that. And um, well, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to have you here and, and, and heard uh, what you, you just said. And there are so many new uh, and good perspectives for the future i'm sure we will grab these opportunities and and, and uh, develop even more uh, uh fruitful partnerships with, with you uh, all thank you very much for for having me and for being and uh that's it thank you Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks very much Claudia. Um, thanks all Thank the best you. for the rest of the symposium and and for the anniversary celebrations Thank you, Tiago. Thank you for sharing this video. And I would like to thank Claudia Camel, who was coordinating this project, and she conducted this partnership with New Zealand. And Claudia, I would like to thank you and all the diplomatic body from New Zealand, and also the New Zealand consulate from Sao Paulo team. And now I would like to give sequence to our presentations. And I would like to invite Professor Dr. Gavid Rezende, um, who is a professor at the School of Technology and Management of Agueda at the University of Aveiro. And he's going to talk about the potential of, of cooperation in Brazil from the University of Aveiro. So please, Dr. David, you have the floor. And after your presentation, we are going to have a Q&A session. Please give him the floor, Professor David. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I have no video. Oh, now I can share it. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to share some slides so that the audience can understand better my presentation. Let me see if I can do that simply. Well, let me share that with you all. Just one more second. All right. Can you see that? All right. Just one more second. Okay, voila. So, Carlos, Carlos Eduardo, thank you so much for the opportunity. And Dr. Jose Paulo, the Tener Arujo, who are the, direct, the previous directors of IOC 
and Dr. Paulo Cruz and Carlos, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here in this symposium. And, and also for the platform that we have got, which is called PICTES, which is our international platform for science, technology, and innovation in health. This presentation will be shared in four parts. I will start with a presentation about uh, Avero and where PICTES is established. And after that, I will be introducing AWAR and, and also this partnership with Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. And the main partners of our platforms and the founders of this platform. Right, right after that, I'm going to introduce the Science and Technology Park of Avira University. Let me uh, go to the second slide. Initially, you all know where Portugal is um, placed in Europe. Of course, and I start this slide with this piece of information that you all have. Portugal in 2020 was considered the strong innovator by the European Innovation Score Board, along with France, Germany, Austria, Belgium, Slovenia, and Ireland. Therefore, we are strong innovators. And in Europe, it's not complex because being a strong innovator, it doesn't mean that the whole country is a strong innovator. But we have regions in Portugal that are much more innovative and more flexible to innovation than others. Aveiro is one of the most innovative regions of our country, along with other ones. And therefore, I'll start talking about Portuguese, covering this, and then I'll be covering Aveiro, which is in this region. And this is an advantage in terms of its position, especially for us that work with health. Therefore, Avero uh, has its clinical academic center, which is, I guess, when you use, as you can see on the slide on the left hand side, has the opportunity to integrate our PET platform in the central region of Portugal. And I'm here talking about something which is very, very new. And our Dean Paulo Jorge was talking to you this morning, which is exactly about this academic, clinical academic center that counts on many institutions from our healthcare system from north to the center of the country. And as we are in the center of everything in this Axis Braga, Porto, Vera, Coimbra, we have a great advantage for being here in the scientific center and also in terms of knowledge. This image, as you see on the left hand side of our um, School of Science and Medical Science Department, the Clinical Academic Center won't be here. It will be another site with this image is just to show you our aptitude that we have got with this new drive of the clinical academic center and how we can get benefited from this strong relationship with the European and Portuguese investment. The Avero uh, clinical academic center is not only about this, we are a very strong center uh, with regards to technology. Avera is one of the most advanced cities in terms of technology in Portugal. 
And also, if you think about Europe, it's very modern, modern and innovative. We are very integrated to technology. Then the projects that we all uh, have contact to, these projects of the 21st century, they require to have more and more technology. And that's why we have this tech city concept with its four pillars. But I'm going to show only two pillars of these axes. And these axes are, you know, based upon these digital transformation. We'll be covering two of these pillars, these four pillars. This is just an image of our internal team where our platform Pictis is based. Then we have two um, founders of this platform, which is University of Aveiro and Fiocruz. One of the pillars of Tech City is the Living Lab, which is a living lab of infrastructure that aims to be a space for testing innovative solutions. And this living lab is spread in many areas, as you can see on these dots. You can see the map of the city center of Aveiro. I, we are here, I live quite here. This is the rice run site. All these dots that you see are part of the living lab and the facilities that uh, uh, we have equipment that is connected to Tax City. We understand that these are one of the pillars uh, that we have got. And we have the second one that is a Vero 5G challenges, which is a cooperation program to recruit talent uh, with technology companies. And the goal is to attract and secure business and talent uh, in a Vero. And with here, we have these programs to attract more and more talent. And that's what I'm going to show you in a few seconds. Therefore, uh, that's what I had to talk about Avero, these two pillars about Avero Tech City. And now I would like to start presenting the University of Avero. As my dean talked to you this morning, Today is not only about university, but it's ECIE, the European Consortium of Innovative Universities. These, all these universities are part of this consortium. And we are going to start working together, uh, providing courses in common. And uh, we are going to have many other things that we're going to have everything integrated within five years. Therefore, this is the Avero University that we have got. It's not only about Avero. And our university is a campus with ideas. And in a field with ideas, I say the following. How do we create knowledge? How do we transfer it to companies from the University of Aveiro? We have cooperation, we have a wide network, and we promote science, and we have this cooperation, which is part of our networks. Then we intend to create a much stronger network with um, as well as foundation. And we have your crews, not only as a partner uh, to receiving comings of people and to transfer technology. We are partners, in fact, to make knowledge exchange. And we are here as partners at the same level. We are no more no less competent than each other. And it's amazing to have um, this partnership with Fundação Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. 
and I'm here one of the pivots, one of the um, one of the pivots of of this partnership between Osvaldo Cruz Foundation and the University of Aveiro. I I can say that we have established a very strong partnership that is beneficial to both parties. We have already signed the agreement and we are here in the Science Park uh, in Aveiro and it's already happening. And for sure, it's going to be a great success for all of us, not only for us to receive investigators from Fiocruz, um, but also to receive uh, researchers from, from Fiocruz um, uh, research innovation technology uh, department and together we will uh, start to part our partnerships at the same level thus how do we create knowledge and transfer that from the university well i say that this is a very wide network here in europe and we want to connect our network to uh, uh, for some, to Osvaldo Cruz Foundation's network as well. On top of it, we have an amazing campus, and I will be showing you in a few seconds. We promote science ranging from primary to secondary students, education students, and other companies and all types of people so it really promotes science as my team has already covered this morning so we have kids from four years of age and we try to format them in such a way that uh, we can bring them to science and since they are very young children just since early childhood we invest in children and we have this international approach we have excellence in research and this is a fact and this is exactly what we offer in terms of this partnership with the same kind of parts of few groups. The University of Aveiro is exactly this image that you see. That's the main campus. We have four campuses. Um, the campus comes to this uh, part downwards which is the science park, and then it goes to the right-hand side. And all this area is the most modern part of the campus, which has been awarded uh, with regards to architecture. And this is our building that you see behind me, which is the library building. And people from all over Europe comes to take a picture of our beta because in terms of architecture, it's a great case study. Then all this, all these campi were created by a group of architects and even our water tank, which is here, my pointer is, it's a water tank that have, has a very interesting design. This campus is amazing. So it's not only about this, this is the most modern part of the campus. But if you go to the right-hand side, you have biology, electronics department, among other departments. Therefore, the other four camping are kind of close to this area. Personally speaking, I'm a professor of the higher school, higher education, of technology management, business management that is uh, 20 kilometers from here, which is also a quite interesting campus. It's not so big, but it's very specific because it's um, a polytechnical branch of our university. Our university itself has some interesting things. Our structure, structure of the university is matrix-based. 
and we don't have colleges. We are split, we are structured in, in, based upon a matrix on, on department. Over here you have 20 research units which are not department and these 20 research units they are interdepartment they have relationship among many different types of departments and then we have electronics biology mechanics that are the same time providing research in these fields and they are interconnected I'd say the mechanics department that is one, one side is here. The topic would be, let me see if it's here on the list. It's over here, Center for Mechanical Technology and Automation. It's TEMA, which is a research unit where we're connected to the mechanics department, but with the biology department, they are designing material for knees. And here we have CSACO, which is the Avery Institute of Materials. It's one of our most awarded departments uh, in our university because it's always, you know, bringing excellence in this field. And then we also have Cezanne that's very much awarded. And I have a colleague from Futures uh, from Sierra who's working at Cezanne, uh, which is the Center for Environmental and Marine Studies. And this colleague has come to Avero under the manage under this partnership that we have we have got. Thus, all these ones that are in blue, they are the ones that are more connected to Fucris. We have twenty research units, and we have other departments as well. Most of them, I mean, all of them are excellent or very good. And that's the evaluation that we have got by an European assessment. Now about Avero, we have a doctoral school, which is at UA, at DOA. And from this doctoral school, I have brought something special, which is the doctoral a doctorate in business innovation dbi which is just for companies and for people with at least five years of experience and it has a relationship with um with people that are in from the munich university of applied sciences so that's a partnership that we have got with this university then I can say that is a very powerful tool uh, in terms of this connection with businesses. They are either from these companies that come to study with us or people that are interested in working for these companies that do this business, doctorate in business and innovation. Uh, this is just how we establish our partnership with the private sector. And this is one of the partnership, very strong partnership that we have got in education. Therefore, it's not only about investigation. I will now move into our unit for cooperation, which is called Dua Coopera, and it's our interface between university and society. This unit may be compared in Brazil to the NITs or the innovation agencies, or maybe a mix of both. This could be called a technology transfer office, but nowadays we cannot call it that way. Because before the WACOPERA, we used to have a unit called UATEC, University of Technology. This was really a technology transfer office, but now, we have changed our philosophy and we have something much greater called Dua Coopera, which uh, incorporates the technology transfer office, but other things of the interface with our entire ecosystem. We have three main pillars, transfer of knowledge and technology, 
entrepreneurship and intellectual property. These three areas show some figures here from Wacopera. We have, for example, if we talk about transfer of knowledge and technology, we can mention 106 projects we have ongoing with companies. 30 millions of investment with companies, 8 million in projects of transfer of knowledge and technology, 600 collaborators, collaborations with foreign entities, 11 million in revenue and collaborations with uh, foreign entities. This is what we had through Wacopera. And I believe that in Brazil, many times, things go through the university and there is an interface with our investigators and our units that are not really accounted for. We're talking about direct connections established with the investigators through other projects. However, these are the official figures from Wacopera in terms of patents. We have 65 international requests for patents and 69 for national patents and 157 requests for other type of intellectual property protection. And now talking about uh, entrepreneurs, we have um, uh, support to entrepreneurship and we have 64 business communications for this year. It's the technology disclosure. 22 startups and 10 spin-offs from our labs at the university. Those units I have shown you a few minutes ago. And we have uh, 3,080 uh, uh, skilled entrepreneurs. Cadu, when, please let me know uh, how I'm doing with regard to time, okay? And now moving directly to the Creative Science Park. That's the PCI, Science and Technology Development from the University of Aveiro. Our Dean mentioned all of that this morning. This is a map of the, our park. Currently, we have these three black buildings. I'm pointing them out. They have been built. We will build other nine buildings. You can see them along this line here. These areas behind are areas for companies, for investors. They're available for companies who would like to be established there. This park has existed for two and a half years, almost two and a half years. This is a picture of the front of the main building. You can see it here. Here we have a picture of the three buildings, see? This on the right is the main building. The other two buildings we call labs. On the next slide, you'll see that in full details. The Creative Science Park is creative because we have the design factory also in there, which is highly connected to creativity. What have we got inside this ecosystem? We have two labs, look, common use labs, those two buildings. They are common use labs. One of them is uh, connected to agro-industry and uh, technology. Probably that's where PICTIS would be established. But now we are using this main building. This is the first year, so we are still getting adjusted. But we will have a new building soon, which will be totally focused on health. That's where we are going to work from. We are still looking for funding for that. And the two looks, one is for ICT and the other is for agro-industrial material. This one is for ICT, electronics, and communication technology, information and communication and electronics. The other building behind it, 
Well, actually, I'm not sure which building is for what. I can never remember properly. This is the internal area of our main building, where we are located. And on the second floor is located the business incubator, which is directly connected to the PCI, to our Creative Science Park. It's integrated to the park due to several reasons. Currently, it makes total sense to have startups and our spin-offs as close as possible to the companies and to their labs inside the parks. So we can have technology transfer from one side to the other. And then we have also the design factory, which is the central part. This picture you can see here is of the design factory. It has two floors. So currently, this park has 86 projects inside the labs and for incubators also. Usually, we organize 100 events each year. 400 people are working with that today. And we have more than 5,000 people involved in the projects of our park. After talking about the park, I'd like to talk about uh, Aveiro in general. What happens with our project flow? And I'd like to give you an idea of how our processes work in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship. This has to do with the University of Aveiro, the incubator, and the whole ecosystem. And here, you can see a few of our resources. We always begin at the university, and we have uh, formal learning and entrepreneurship, and then we have the training. It is connected to CBT and Acelera and Labi. I'm talking here about three problems of acceleration of ideas, not companies, ideas, mind it. These ideas come from our labs. And then we have to work on the protection of these ideas. We always work on this process. People who work in innovation know how these things are. And then when they enter the incubator or as companies, because before becoming a company, the incubator has to go through a full process. And then it moves to the PCI, where we have several activities, where these entrepreneurs are going to be engaged from PCI to sharing. You have seminars and much more training in the areas of finance and marketing and many other areas. And then we have the competition to get funds. Basically, that's what it's about. We have to learn how to get into the game and look for funding. And after that, we will validate our idea All that remaining inside the incubator will try to validate the idea and to accelerate our ideas. And then we have to achieve growth. These companies can remain inside the incubator for up to three years. All that is connected to the UA incubator and the incubator of the PCI is contained in the Aveiro region business incubator. Actually, it's a network of incubators. Why is it a network? Why do we work as a network? Because we have an idea that if it's more for agriculture, for wines, they go to Oliveira, Dubai, Ho, and Anadia. That is where we have one of the best uh, sparkling wine in Portugal. That's where we have the wines from Bahada. 
among other things. Oh, time? Am I running out of time? Well, if it's an incubator, here is our incubator. We are 300 incubators in this region. Therefore, the incubator has these um, specificities, and this is what I should tell you about. I'd like to inform you that you are almost uh, out of time. Can you please uh, close? I apologize. Okay, this is the UA incubator. We have the startup visa and startup voucher. I'm talking about 12 months for a business idea. It's a salary of 800 euros for two people. So they can remain inside the incubator testing their ideas. The startup visa is for people from abroad, international people, so they can also test their ideas inside the incubator. All of that is contained inside our park of science and innovation. Our park is called PICTIS. I should be more focused on the PICTIS. I will not really have time to tell you about it, but it's the International Platform for Science, Technology, and Innovation in Health. It's a part of the PCI, it's the soft land of IOC Fiocruz in Europe, and it is the access to science and technology for our institutions. And there is funding from Europe and from Portugal, and it integrates our networks of innovation. So, PICTIS will now begin with these projects that are included here, vaccines, research and development, fighting multi-resistant bacteria, One Health, the 4.0 industry in healthcare and innovation policies. We are here in the center. The PICTIS has the advantage of being located in a region and in a city where it is possible to receive funding with ease. And of course, we will seize this opportunity in the Europe horizon for the next years. And obviously, we are now ready to close a project that will receive funding. Well, we hope so, at least we're testing it. I believe we are about to achieve this funding for the next two years of 2.5 million euros, which would be approximately 17 billion Brazilian reais for the next two years. And our pick is close to receiving this funding so we can focus on those four items I mentioned on the previous slide. Thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for being a bit over time. This is what I had to tell you. Big Cheese is waiting for our partners at Phil Cruz and all the partners in our ecosystem. Thank you very much. And here I finish my talk. Thank you very much, Professor David. Thank you for your presentation. Many questions were sent through our YouTube channel. I will begin reading a couple of them. The first question for Dr. Paulo Guiz. Dr. Paulo Bus. The first question. Is how you assess the mechanism called other transaction authority for the vaccine of COVID-19 in the US. This was developed by the Defense Department regulated by the National Defense Law. Are you aware of this mechanism and how do you see this tool? Well, unfortunately, I don't think I can answer because I do not know what this is about, and I would thank you very much. 
maybe the person who asked this question could send me more info. Thank you very much, Paulo. We can look for additional information so we can try to answer via email. There is no problem. One more question. It came through our YouTube channel. It's actually a statement from Dr. Tânia Araújo Jorge saying that our center will be a first-class partner. I can already anticipate the answer from Dr. Paulo Bus. This partnership is growing and improving year after year. I have no doubts. However, I will give the floor to Dr. Paulo. I don't know if Tânia was here in the beginning. I really emphasized how pleased we were with her election. There was a seminar some time ago with the IOC on international cooperation, and she participated mentioning back then how important this connection of the IOC is, not only with Chris in order to assist in international cooperation, but also focusing on the idea of working all together in the formulation and implementation of initiatives of international cooperation of Fiocruz. Thank you, Tânia. You can count on me with Chris if you need us. And we wish you an excellent mandate during the for next year's. I don't know if I will resist for that long. At the forefront, because it is really, really tiresome, but I do wish you all the best. IOC is one of the most important um, pillars for international cooperation at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. We know that. Thank you, Paulo. We have here other questions that are more technical and related to the transfer of biological samples according to the new law, the law 14141, which defines the transfer of biological samples to other countries. I believe this can be sent to our technical areas. I'm quite sure they will be more able to answer. I'd like to remind you, Carlos Eduardo, that in this case, the surveillance coordination remains under the rule of our colleague Venancio, Tânia and Marília Santini. They are totally updated. They are closely following all these actions. And this was very important because there are many ongoing investigations and few crews tried to solve these issues, focusing on the cooperation in the biological area. This cooperation was forced. We really, really struggled to get it. And finally, the National Congress gave us the attention we required in order to regulate properly this question of samples, in order to regulate the biomedical research. Thank you, Paulo. There is another question here from to Professor David about the schools for the development of drugs. It comes from Luciano Pereira Jr. and the University of Aveiro with the pharma school that would be available for pharmaceutical technology. Professor David. Thank you for the question. Well, one of our research institutes is connected to this field. And obviously, um, this is an area that we are really interested in. And we have two institutions that are prepared to be dialoguing and performing the interface of um, institutions to take care of this topic. 
of course, need to have to find the investigators. So you should talk to them or get into PICTs. Our platform is exactly for that. You should either then uh, get in touch with the investigators directly or get in our platform so that you can have the contact with of your university. Then I suggest you talk to PICTs directly. And for sure, we would put, get you in contact with our ongoing studies. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor David. Thank you, Professor Paulo Boos, as well, for your availability and the technical questions that are more addressed to the surveillance coordinator. The coordination will be addressed to all of you and for sure responded as well. And here we would like to thank you all. But I'd like to pose a comment very quickly. I thought it would have more questions because of time restrictions. I would like to take advantage of Professor David and Paulo Puz. I have um, information that in Portugal, the part related to tourism, the tourism hunt has a very important revenue for Portugal, especially uh, the hunt of the wild rabbit. Habit, a rabbit, and great part of that are later uh, invested in the veterinary study for research. And then when I was exchanging information with Dr. Paulo Bus that at the beginning of uh, the beginning of the current president, uh, we we think that it's very important to have a connection with the Minister of Defense. Sorry, you know, it's a, a motorcycle passing by, so it's very noisy. Then I would like to know about the investments in this field. And not only working with the Minister of Health, but also Minister of Agriculture, Livestock. And I believe that we should have a very close relationship with the other ministries so that we can see this concept of one health and then find resources for investments in research. So I'd like to know here from Paulo Bus and Professor David to see if this information is true and how we'll deal with that in Portugal. And I would like to congratulate on both of you and this potentiality of a relationship with New Zealand. I believe it's very clear that New Zealand and agriculture, they invest 15% in research that comes from agriculture. And this is quite important. Thank you and sorry for interrupting. Well, I believe that this idea of um, um, getting resource from the Minister of Agriculture from Brazil. It's very important, but, you know, I think that they have already given more importance when Embrapa was not only supported, but it would have a more intense initiative in terms of agriculture and livestock and especially with this Palafi's operation that was in touch with Portugal. But the, because they are called the Field Cruise of Agriculture and we are called the Embrapa of Health. I believe that we need to get associated with Embrapa because Embrapa is a public uh, state-owned company. It's not an institution like ours. It has got different characteristics in terms of legal issues, but we have a history of a cooperation with Embrapa, and Embrapa has got resources for research. And I believe that this area is very interesting for Embrapa. And uh, it should be guided by um, 
uh, made this relationship with the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation, which is the Embrapa, the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation. And Embrapa has recognized the capability in sequencing uh, capabilities in animal health. Uh, I have seen recently a beautiful presentation of One Health seminar that Chris has made about someone from Embrapa, which was brilliant. And they would cover these topics. I believe that Portugal as a whole should also be interested in this type of relationship, uh, especially for uh, for confined animal uh, production. And it can be bridge of pathogens that are not good for pathogens. And because the animals are very, very similar. And for these animals at a breeding feedlots, they are very important to be covering these fields. And you could see in Alabama, for example, in situations where animals were breeded in feedlots. That's why Portugal has great interest in that. I believe we should work together and with more European institutions that might be interested in it. Let's say that this production of feedlot production is very strong in Europe and Brazil, is even higher in China as well. And I have to remember that our cooperation has to be with NIH, China, Europe, and everyone, and you're ready for that. So great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paolo. I'm not the right person to be answering uh, this topic related to wildlife, but the very university has a unit that deals with animal life, wildlife, and we have um, an investigator of a few crews that is working here with us that they are making the screening of pathogens of hunting hunted animals and also wildlife. And One Health is one of the topics, one of the most important topics of this platform. However, I believe that what I can say has to do with uh, something which is the residence recovering plan in Europe, which is an European plan in each uh, a state uh, is doing the way they want, and this uh, recovery plan is financed with a huge amount of money. And, and this uh, plan of recovery, um, they have many projects, and I believe that One Health is one of the backgrounds of this uh, program. That's the only thing I can share because I don't know much about uh, wild rabbits. So I cannot answer your question specifically about that. I don't know if I could, if I helped somehow. That's no problem. Thank you, Professor David. Well, just one more thing. Our initial funding that we expect to be approved, which is 2.6 million euros for the first two years. One of the lines of research units is about One Health that will be about financing and funding, for example, 17 million, uh, 2.6 million euros. And then in one of our work packages, it has to do with One Health and also these projects that were mentioned here. So I believe it can be split in three parts. Thank you. That's great to know about that. In order to wrap up, 
I would like to bring two other points that has just come from YouTube, Dr. Tanya Araujo-Jorge. She mentions uh, the interaction uh, with the technological park called the Federal University of uh, Rio de Janeiro, and that she wants to establish a partnership with the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And then we have a great relationship with COP and um, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and COP is was one that has supported this relationship that we have got with the University of El Perro. José Augusto. José Augusto Santos also mentions something to Professor David, which is the importance of incubators, and he asks if the University of Aveiro stimulates uh, this type of approach. Of course, I can respond yes. You have mentioned in your presentation, but if Professor David, if you want to quickly add something, the only point is the following: we are here just waiting. We are here, waiting. We are the, we are the, no, we are we are the groom, we are the groom. We are the church, just waiting for the bride to just the bride come and then we get married. We have the incubator, and we have two ways of receiving and helping supporting business ideas in the Vero. One is startup voucher. It's a voucher for startups and ideas of business for one year. And the other one is a startup visa, which is not only to Brazilians, but to people from all over the world to get in here with a visa with the incubators. For example, a person who has a business idea and they want to apply for a startup visa, and then they will apply to have a startup voucher to have 1.7 thousand euros per per month and, and then if you tried something but it didn't work so you can get back but if it works properly you have an award to start your business and it won't be a pre-company but it will be a startup within the incubator and then you pursue uh, funding and it won't be a startup visa it will be something else another model the incubator is here waiting for good ideas, entrepreneurs that want to invest in here. Thank you, Professor David. We have no further questions in our YouTube channel, and you don't have any other questions from Zoom. I'd like to thank you all for your participation. You dear colleagues, Dr. Jose Paulo, on behalf of the board team, thank you for the support, and to Chris, Dr. Paulo Buz, Dr. David and our participants of this panel and see you all tomorrow. May you have a very good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.